Your Creative Push, episode 119. You have to turn off the script. If you're born and you're going to be an artist, you're just going to be an artist. It's not negotiable. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Moira Hahn. Moira is a talented artist who has exhibited her fine art throughout the United States, Japan, and Canada over the last two decades. She has traveled all over the Southwest to study petroglyphs, pictographs, and Native American visual culture. And Moira, thank you, first of all, uh, for coming on the show. Could you start by telling us exactly what are petroglyphs and pictographs? (laughs) Hey, young man. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on the show. It's an honor. Uh, As for the question about the rock art, the petroglyphs are art that is actually chiseled into rock using harder uh, stone implements. And pictographs are like cave paintings where the artist uses kaolin or clay or other pigment, maybe hematite, and can draw an image in different colors on the surface of rock. Very cool. And so you so you travel and you, you study those, um, and then <laughs> do they make their way into your art? They did. Not so much now, although I might get back into it because I'm still fascinated by it. But back in the 90s, okay, so the short story is I had a friend who taught anthropology at a community college nearby. We were both scheduled to teach summer classes, and we didn't quite have enrollment. So he signed up for mine, and I signed up for his. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) And we made enrollment, and I forgot to drop myself from his class, and for some reason he made me take it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so gotcha. it turned out to be a travel class that uh we all drove all over this part of uh california and um a little bit into the great basin and, and camped and studied rock art in various places and that got me really interested in it that was back around you know, late 90s i guess very cool you're saying that you might get back into that where where have you has your art like kind of deviated and taken a turn well my art is always deviating and taking turns, but my earliest influence was I had this uncle stationed in Japan who used to send my family these like care packages of Japanese textiles and clothing and shoes and uh, folk toys and scrolls, just really cool stuff. So I grew up looking at that, and, and that's something I've been attracted to all along that's found its way into my art. You have a very unique style that it's it, absolutely beautiful. I mean, that's the reason that I, that I reached out to you. Thank you. Where did that the the current style that you have? Where did that start? And like, did it take a while for you to to develop something that you are you know were comfortable saying, "Ah, oh, this is Moira's you know art. This is my <laughs> what I want to say." I was probably so naive at the beginning that if it was bad, I didn't know it. So I've been, I haven't been too shy about exhibiting my work, even from when I was a teenager. And some of my first jobs were illustrating posters for local art shows and um, just freelance jobs for local newspapers and magazines. But um, as far as developing a style, I, I think it's always developing. I don't feel like I'm at you know, my peak. I kind of hope not because I think all of us are always changing and evolving and hopefully getting better as we work. Absolutely. How did you get over that fear of exhibiting? Because I think a lot of people have that where they're afraid to to share. They're maybe not as naive. Mm -hmm. Uh, What advice would you give to, to somebody who is, you know, who has that same fear? I think you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. So you have to have enough confidence to just put your stuff out there. And if it doesn't get into whatever show you may have entered it into, try to find out why. And try again and do it better or do it differently or enter a different show. Find a different juror. <laughs> you know? Right, so, right. Yeah, I, wasn't, I probably wasn't shy enough about it. I, I, I was not good at anything but art. And so I really made an effort to make my way in art. I think a lot of people, you know, have that that, that fear that, you know, if they get rejected, that it's going to be the end of their art career or it's going to be the the one thing that that just defines the end of of what they do. And I think it's completely wrong. And once you get that first rejection, it's you realize it's not that bad. You know, it's just one person that it doesn't fit in with. And it's really like you said, you just have to be kind of brave and brazen and just keep putting it out there, keep pushing it out there. And like you said, 
you know, you, you're only going to get what you ask for. So you have to be willing to ask for it over and over again sometimes. <laughs> That's so <laughs> true. And just, you know, a lot of it, like you said, it's a matter of luck or the person's preference. One thing that's really great now that you couldn't do so much when I was young is say you want to enter a show, find out who the juror is and then mm. look at their work. Find out what they like. See as much as you can read about them. Read up on what their interests are and what style they love. And, you know, that way you're not going to waste your $35 <laughs> with an abstract painter <laughs> if what you do is beautiful still likes of teapots. Right, <laughs> <You> right. <know>? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Do your due diligence to to figure out, and not necessarily to change your style, to change what you do, um, but to just find the thing that works the best for that particular audience, for that particular juror, like you said. And, you know, sometimes you you might find that it's not the right fit and, you Mm -hmm. know. Just mm-hmm. save yourself the the money and also just the the hard feelings, you know, the 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 rejection. That's right, and it's no reflection on the quality of your work, which is a hard thing for many of us to get past. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't take it personally. Mm-hmm. Could you take us back to your first or one of your first creative moments and tell us that story? Sure, I'd love to. Thank you. Well, when I was a little kid, my mom uh, would kind of get tired of having a bunch of kids underfoot and would give us chores. And so she quite often would send me out in the backyard and say, see those patios, rake those leaves. <laughs> so we always had a lot of leaves. So uh, I remember one time I figured, well, there are two patios here, an upper and a lower. So I started taking the lower one and raking leaves into the shape of a cowboy on a horse with a sunset and all this stuff. And <laughs> I made this painting mm. out of the leaves. And I called her to the upper patio and said, look down on this. And she's like, Wow. (laughs) It was so fun to work huge like that. It was a pretty good sized patio. So uh, that's one of my early memories. And another one, my dad um, used to get his shirts dry cleaned and they came back with cardboard in them. And I was an addict of those little capsule toys you can get at the supermarket where you put a nickel in and you get this little plastic capsule. Now it's probably a dollar, but when I was a kid, <laughs> it was a nickel. Right, right. It was a little egg uh, things. <laughs> yeah. And so I would like take my school glue and glue those capsules on and make weird faces and stuff on my dad's shirt cardboards and I just had a ball like making stuff like that. I would take a jar lid and a magnet out by the roadside and start sifting through the dirt on the shoulder and pull out little magnetic particles of metal and then like make faces and pull the magnetic uh fragments around and I don't know I just was always doing creative stuff I had a wild imagination and any chore could be made more interesting <laughs> yeah do you find that you still uh, have that same imagination that same <laughs> unfortunately I do and sometimes I get distracted <laughs> <Unfortunately>. <laughs> because I'm in the middle of a painting and I want to go you know make something out of <laughs> you know recyclables instead so I have right. to kind of like rein my energy toward you know the the main uh, purpose for the moment yeah, well, do you think that that's a bad thing necessarily? Like you said, unfortunately, but <laughs> sometimes if you have a deadline, you really can't do that. But I, I always have that pull to go do something, especially when I'm I'm working on a project and I know it's going to take weeks to get it perfect. I mm. love doing like real quick things that just kind of you know are spontaneous and not so steady. Yeah, well, sometimes you need that too, especially with l- larger projects like you're saying. Probably to, to so. take the pressure off a little bit, but I yeah, not so. too much. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. Not too many shiny objects. Well, I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because oh, sure. I think yeah. sometimes you know I think everybody has that as a kid, and it's just a matter of when it dies. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice that it that it hasn't died, and I think for um, people that are kind of sucked into their their jobs and their you know it's it's tough for them to get back to their creativity it's yeah. trying to get back to that childlike wonder you know just getting back to that where it's you're just doing it for doing it you know you're doing it because why not <laughs> that's so true it's funny because i actually turned 60 a couple of weeks ago and um, happy birthday oh well thank you and that's a big deal especially in japanese culture that's like a big deal to turn 60 it means that you return to your childhood so i was telling mm. this to a few friends all of whom are around my age and they're like whoever left <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, return to what true. i think for artists and musicians it's not quite the same because we that is a gift that we're able to just sustain that throughout our lives Absolutely. Yeah. It's very inspiring too. So happy birthday and and congratulations. Thank you. So aside from the kind of initial fears that you had with, you know, the fear of kind of exhibiting or sending your work out, are there any things that hold you back today um, and hold you back 
on a daily basis from getting your work done? Uh, yeah, there are. There are. I mean, from the beginning, my dad, well, my parents were pretty much supportive of me being an artist, but my dad would caution me that I should go to school and learn something practical so I could support myself. And mm. I, I think he was really wary of me going to art school. He wished that I would, you know, become a dental hygienist or something I could rely <laughs> on rather than, you know, be an artist. Because in his own family, no one was a professional artist. There were people who were, you know, homemakers that made art when they had time, but no one, no one had tried to become a professional artist. And, you know, when I look back, I understand his fears. And I'm not quite sure why I I wasn't as cognizant of them at that age. I just, I listened to him and I didn't want him to feel disrespected, but I just kept doing my art and I did go to art school and, you know, my whole life I've been an artist, so. Well, I think that's a, uh, like kind of a, not that your story is unoriginal, but that's mm-hmm. like a common thing that I think a lot of people can relate to. It's yeah. that um, if it's not from the parents, it's from the, a spouse or it's from a friend or it seems like. Nobody wants to support people doing like one of the most important things in the world, I think, uh, yeah. which is art and creativity That's um, so true. because of because of money. It's it sucks. <laughs> it yeah, sucks that it's, it's that, a really that it's that tough way. row. Yeah. And, and I taught full time for years and my students would occasionally ask me, should I do this for a living? And, you know, a lot of their parents would say you can become a graphic designer because they actually make money. They can design mm. websites and do, you know products like that. And that's that's a good compromise. It gives them some time to do their own art on the side if they care to. But I would just tell them, if you want to be an artist with your heart and soul, do it. But it's, it's not going to be easy. You give up a lot to do it. For sure. A lot of, a lot of sacrifice. But yeah, if it if it's the thing that you're you know you know that you're meant to do, like you kind of have to do it, or else you're just gonna <laughs> That's it. live a kind of miserable life. And and if you do go down a different path, which a lot of people listening now do, you know, it, which is completely understandable. Myself, I'm a poker dealer, you know, that mm-hmm. has nothing to do with with writing or creativity at all. Mm-hmm. But it's like you gotta still find the the way to to satisfy that kind of hunger, that desire to, to create, um, that doesn't always go away. So it's like, it's like therapy for some people and it's, you kind of have to have to find a way to incorporate it somehow. That's so true. And I did wind up teaching, um, part-time for years and full-time for about 12 years. And that, you know, it had its pluses and minuses, but one good thing about teaching was that, I was the only full-timer for several years in a college with a lot of art students. So I was uh, assigned to teach sculpture, drawing, painting, illustration, (laughs) printmaking, art history, all these different things. And I had to really study up on them because half of them I didn't have a clue how to do. I did have a master's in art, but that didn't mean I was an expert in all these different fields and genres. So, Hmm. um, you know, the good thing about it was you could not be in a rut while you had that job. You didn't have a whole lot of time to do your own work, but you sure as heck had things to think about and learn. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. With the resistances and the things, some of the things that held you back, like the support of your parents and stuff like that, mm-hmm. how do you combat those things and, and really defeat them? <sighs> you have to turn off the script. And I just, like you said before, Youngman, I mean, if you're born and you're going to be an artist, you're just going to be an artist. It's not right. like negotiable. I'm not gay, but I think it's probably like that. You know, you have an orientation and that is what you do, period. And I knew that about myself. I knew as an artist. So one thing that helps a lot is to always have shows or grant applications or, uh, you know, lessons or lectures. Just always have stuff lined up and that keeps you on schedule because if I had nothing on the horizon, maybe I'd be less of a... I don't know, proactive or less focused on getting stuff done. Mm. Uh, Life is short. And at this age, I'm more cognizant of that. It's easier to keep it in mind. Yeah, you just have to turn off all those negative scripts and do the work at hand. And if there isn't any, make some. (laughs) For sure. Yeah, make your own script, Mm -hmm. make your own work and get it done that way. Make your own deadlines. Get yourself back into it. Sometimes it's hard, but you know, for me, it's like, <clears throat> what else would I do? It's the only thing I love to do. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point about the deadlines. I think that setting a, be, well, first of all, being able to have the capacity to 
adhere to those deadlines and not just keep pushing them off. Mm -hmm. But to be able to make self-imposed deadlines is a huge skill to have, I think. And then to be able to adhere to them is is, uh, equally (laughs) uh, important. But it's it's really important to do that because you could go years without creating something like, like mm-hmm. I did. Mm-hmm. I w- t- it took me two years to create an idea that I had in my head and really? what a waste, you know, wow. what a waste of time. Why did it um, take so long? I was scared. Uh-huh. I was scared I of, of, of not doing it or mm-hmm. I was scared of doing it rather and what people mm-hmm. would think. And just, I don't know, just it's, it's scary when you have a new idea that you're not sure how it will be received. But my advice always is, you know, do it just for yourself and just pretend that nobody's ever going to see it and then make that decision later. You That's know, just a really do it for yourself. good idea. I like the way you phrased that and everything about it. I, I know exactly what you mean because for a while I wanted to do something about greed and the 1% and I wanted it to feature mm. squirrels, but I'm not good at drawing squirrels. <laughs> so <laughs> a painting took two years just to get a good squirrel head. <laughs> you know? Oh, nice. I mean, it's not like I wasn't doing anything else at the same time, but it was just not familiar and I had a hard time coming up with something I was satisfied with so I know what you're talking about did you create that I did mm-hmm. I really like that can we, can we see it yeah I'll send you that when I send you the, the pictures ah so cool we'll have that linked in the show notes page <laughs> then yourcreativepush.com your okay. slash Mora. great do you have like a worst moment or hardest time um, specifically speaking about um, resistance and, and things that hold you back yes thank you uh, okay so when I was about, oh golly, in my 40s anyway, I thought I should go back to school and get a master's degree. And I was really doing that because I, all along, in order to support myself, I was showing in galleries and occasionally doing illustration and occasionally teaching, but it was getting harder and harder to find teaching work without a master's. So I went back to school, I got a master's degree, and then I got a full-time job and I kept that for about 10 years. But what happened was there was only one other fellow working full-time for this college, and he retired, and he wasn't replaced. So I had his workload plus my workload. And all my colleagues were supportive. The other faculty were wonderful, and they kept voting for uh, replacement faculty because they knew how hard it was for me to teach an overload and do all the department work and chair the department and have all these different adjuncts, but um, without much help. But uh, the administration chose not to replace him. So that job was just onerous. It got worse and worse. So I wanted to quit. But by then, I was making pretty good money. And it was uh, really hard to make the decision to quit. It was kind of like, Mm -hmm. you know, life affirming Mm -hmm. in a way, because as you're probably aware, as an artist or musician, you don't make great money. And, you know, I was finally making a middle class life, you know, (laughs) stipend. So anyway, but I wanted to quit. And it took me about five years to quit. Mm. And, you know, and I was just like saving money and thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. And I'll I'll find some other small teaching jobs to, you know, bolster our income. But I'm going to do this at this point. And I really thought when I quit, I was expecting a surge of pent up creativity. But a few things happened around that. My mom died, Hmm. and I started getting really bad migraine headaches. So here, I finally had quit my job, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be painting my head off. I'm going to be painting 18 hours a day. I'm going to be so happy. But instead, I was depressed because my mom had just died, and my migraine headaches got worse. So I spent Hmm. five years experimenting with different drugs to try and find a solution to that so I could be the least bit creative. So that was probably the worst moment is going through all these different you know, uh, treatments to try and cure the migraine headaches and get back on the horse and start painting again. Yeah. And I think a lot of people will have various things that hold them back like that, that Uh they aren't in control of. And after you said it took about five years. Right. Yes. After that, what was it like? Did you finally get to that point where everything was kind of like back on even ground and then you were able to paint 18 hours a day or did that ever happen? Yeah, it it pretty much did. But it was a matter of finding the right combination of drugs that would Mm. serve as prophylactic so that the migraines weren't as frequent or severe. And Mm. then um, just, you know, taking out all those drawings and getting to work on them. And it helped a lot that I was offered shows and I was starting to get really good response to my work in group shows. And uh, yeah, things started happening again. But I just wanted to tell you, it was like, it didn't happen the way I thought it would. And when I thought things would be the best, they were the hardest. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you you can always have expectations, but whenever the the expectations are completely different than than you expected, then uh, it's just a matter of kind of pivoting and and figuring out the way to to make it the way you want it. Yeah, that's right. Um, on the flip side, you have a, a best moment. <laughs> yes, I do. So <laughs> uh, a few years ago, a previous art dealer basically told me I was washed up. <laughs> And uh, she specifically talked about a painting that she said she couldn't sell. No one was interested in it. Basically, she was just telling me people didn't like my work anymore, which was, of course, really painful. But then Mm. it's curious that, like, out of the blue, another dealer inquired about work for a museum show. And it was a specific theme. So I sent him a few JPEGs, and there was one piece that he liked quite a bit. So he put it in the group show. And the museum chose to make a banner from that painting that spanned the entire front of the museum over all three entrances. And then Mm. they bought the painting, and it was like one of my most expensive paintings. That was the same painting that this previous dealer told me (laughs) that she couldn't do anything with. Yeah, (laughs) got her. (laughs) This is the kind of thing that helped me get back on track. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and I'm so grateful, but it just makes you realize what we were talking about at the beginning. If one juror doesn't like your work, who cares, right? Right. Just keep showing it. Somebody else will love it. Yeah, and it's so hard, too, because, you know, even, like, you get one negative review for the podcast or your music video gets, like, one dislike, and it's just, it's, like, all you can focus on is that one. Isn't that and I don't silly? know what the ratio, yeah. we've talked about it a lot on the show, I don't know what the ratio is, I think it's something somewhere around, like, 100 to 1, like, it takes, like, 100 positive comments to, to even out just one negative uh, comment. Well, I'm sure that ratio is different for different people, but you're you're exactly right. It's just tastes, you know. Right. It's just somebody doesn't happen to like what what you do, or perhaps you you have no idea why they don't like it. Maybe they're jealous. Um, usually, it's probably an issue with them, but that should not be a reason to hold you back from still loving your art and still trying to to push it and get it into more hands and more eyes and and just keep pushing it because you know more people will will be affected positively by it than than negatively so i love that it's that that it was that particular piece that that's all that's <laughs> so awesome never sell it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> screw <right>. you <laughs> so well, good I so good there's a context for all these comments and we don't know what that context is most of the time and in in this situation it may have been that she had an opening that you know may not have sold as much as she wanted who knows but for yeah. whatever reason, she wasn't um, receptive to that painting. Yeah. So yeah, just ignore the haters. <laughs> just, exactly. just forget about them because totally let them it. let them deal with it. Do you have a, a greatest inspiration or even um, a favorite book or YouTube clip or anything else that you draw inspiration from, and that maybe we could as well? Well, lately I have to tell you, I'm pretty addicted to Pinterest because I can put in any artist's name and instantly look at a lot of their work and then go to links and research them further and find out, uh, you know, what the the context of that piece was. For example, as you probably know from looking at my art, I love Japanese woodblock prints. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you just put in an unusual name, maybe someone you're not as familiar with, and all of a sudden there's like this world of their images that pops up. So that's been inspiring for me lately. Yeah, you can find basically anything that you want. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is it's totally cool to like pull from that too. Not not copy yeah. obviously, but right. to to, save to it. surround yourself and yeah, save it as like part of your your bank of things that you can That's try to create it yourself. Yeah. yeah, years ago and I I'm assuming you're quite a bit younger than I am, right? 30. Like in your 30s. Yeah, okay. So yeah. you're half my age. So when I yeah. was your age, this is before the internet, we would keep as illustrators, we keep something called a morgue and it was basically a file cabinet with manila folders that had clippings that we made of all the different things we were interested in that we were sometimes called upon to illustrate. Well, this is kind of like that. They're like a billion times better. So I'm really enjoying that. An on-demand yeah. morgue. I like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. So cool. Um, man, this has been really inspiring, but it's time for the final push. <laughs> and this, this is where I ask you to reach to the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today. Somebody that's thinking, you know, maybe I should get back to this or maybe I need to turn off the script as we were talking about earlier. Just give them your best advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. Okay, so I put this at the end of my email for about five years before I quit my full-time job, and it's a quote from a fellow named William G.T. Shedd, S-H-E-D-D is the last name. A ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. 
I felt like mm. I was just stalled out. It was in a harbor. I had a good job. It paid well. But mm. I wasn't doing my art very much. And uh just started realizing this doesn't go on forever, you know. <laughs> so maybe they could think about that. You know, just think about if there's something else they want to do, start doing it at night. Start doing it on the weekends. See if they can cut down on their work schedule. See if that would be allowed so that they can pour themselves into what they were born to do because mm. life's short, and it would be a shame if they didn't get to do that. They're not going to be on their deathbed saying, oh, I wish I had put in extra hours at the office. They're going to be thinking, I didn't write that novel, and I had a really mm. good idea. You know, I didn't want to be that person, and I hope no one else will be that person. I think it's up to us to chart our own course and just do it. That's all. Just get into it and do it. It won't be easy. My life hasn't been that easy since I quit. I'm always taking on part-time teaching gigs, but you know what? I love it because I feel like I'm calling the shots. I can decide whether I take a class or not. I'm mapping my course, and it's working. And I, I hope everybody that wants to do that will be able to do that. Hmm, I love it. Yeah, it's it's charting your own course. And like you said, that I love that quote. I, I'm going to steal that and put it in my signature line because it's, <laughs> it's so true, though. <laughs> The, cause it will always, you know, the port will always be there. And mm-hmm. like you said, you can, you don't have to necessarily like leave, leave the port forever. You know, like you said, you can take some, some night cruises <laughs> and mm-hmm. just kind of venture out a little bit and, and see what else is out there, you know, just to, to venture out as opposed to staying in the, in the port at all times, you know, mm-hmm. I love it. Mm-hmm. It was a scary thing to do, but I have no regrets whatsoever. I, I would highly recommend it. Oh, I love it. Uh, Moira, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for really inviting me. It. I had a ball. <laughs> of course. Uh, and you can find Mora on her website at Mora Han, M-O-I-R-A-H-A-H-N.com. And again, you can head to yourcreativepush.com slash Mora to find out about all the links that we talked about today, uh, including uh, some of her images. So thank you again so much, and we will talk to you later. Thanks so much, Youngman. Take care. <laughs> no matter what I do, I can't get over that that last quote she said. A ship in the harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. It's so true. Just think about that. Think about your art career as as a ship. And you have an art career, whether you like it or not, even if you're just creating the art now, even if you're just keeping it to yourself, it's a career or a potential career. Really ask yourself, are, are you being safe? Are you just making stuff and not putting it out there? It's scary, but you, you've got to do it. You should be wanting to share your work because the world deserves to see it and the work will not share itself. I think that's a common disappointment, you know, when you create something and it just doesn't naturally go viral on its own. Um, you have to take matters in your own hands and get it out there. And you have to ask people to look at your work and to share it uh, in whatever way, whether it be, you know, hanging up in a gallery or somebody linking to it or sharing it uh, online, whatever it is, you should be getting eye- more eyes on it because your art is a ship. You know, it really is. It's it's a ship that can go places and it's a very satisfying uh, thing to build this this massive ship but you just got to remember that it can go places and it, it is scary to venture out into the world into like the unknown where you're not quite sure what will happen when you get there um, but you kind of have to venture out and do what what ships are built for i don't know i can't stop talking about this quote i just love it but like Morris said there's going to be some situations that are going to be a guaranteed failure because your work doesn't fit into what a potential juror wants to see. So why guarantee yourself a rejection? Really do your research if you're submitting to shows or whatever it is that you're trying to get your creative work into. If you're trying to get it into online galleries or Instagram accounts that share work, really look at what they like and see if you fit in. And again, don't change your work to fit them, but find things that fit what you're already making. And this goes for all creative people, you know, for writers, for videographers, for photographers, whatever your creative discipline, there's there's somebody that wants to see it, and there's somebody that can help you, um, and it's your job to, to figure out who 
that person is. Perhaps you already know who that person is or who that group is or, or what that thing is that can help to share your work and, and make it appreciated by more people. So don't be scared to venture out and set sail. <laughs> but that is it for today. Hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done and then share it out. Get more eyes on it. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be here for you on Wednesday if you need the push again. Have a wonderful, productive couple of days, and we will see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.